Good morning. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to uh, thank, thank you for the opportunity to come and speak here with you and share this time. I want to thank Kevin for his prayer and Ernie for his reading, Ernie Taylor for his uh, reading of our scripture this morning. Um, it is good to be back in Boise. I know that we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. We are all the body Christ of Christ, and we are all family. But there are people that I love when I look out in this audience and that have meant a lot to me in my life. And so it is particularly good to be here with you this morning. Today we're going to talk about forgiveness. And forgiveness can be a brutally difficult topic. I think it can be difficult because we need to be real about the fact that we can do grievous harm to one another. And that harm can have lasting impacts on us. And if we underplay or we we understate the transgression that we can do to each other, then it not only makes difficult our ability to forgive, but it cheapens a lot of things and it's against what we learn as Christians. And so I want to start by saying this morning when we're talking about forgiveness, hopefully it will come out and hopefully it will, I will be able to state in a way that I think forgiveness is it's truly difficult and I don't want to diminish the pain that anyone has suffered while we talk about forgiveness this morning. So let's begin with this question. Is there a difference between Christian and non-Christian forgiveness? What's the impetus for Christian forgiveness that maybe doesn't apply to the non-Christian, I will propose to you that there is a great difference. And how are we doing at forgiving others? Please ask yourselves these questions this morning as we study scripture together. Um, I think, okay, great. If you notice in the upper left here, or upper right real quick, uh, my wife said, you need to, you need to say this. The, the Bereans in the upper right, we're going to be looking at our reading this morning, Matthew 18, 21 through 35, where Peter asks, how many times do we forgive? And then Jesus gives him a responding parable. I'm going to reference the rest of these scriptures. So if you are like the noble Bereans who were applauded for making sure that what they were being taught was in scripture, I might, I might go rapidly through those scriptures, so you are forewarned. There are really three types of forgiveness that, that I wanted to look at. I wanted to, to talk today about all forgiveness. And then as I studied, I realized maybe I could talk about half of what the Bible says about forgiveness. And then I realized... In our short time this morning, we're going to talk about a small portion of what the Bible has to say about forgiveness because it is so core to the Christian faith. The first type of forgiveness that I thought, you know, most importantly uh, that we can't talk about this morning is God's forgiveness of us. God's forgiveness is grace, and it's amazing grace. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5.8. We are in a state of rebellion against God. We have not asked for forgiveness. We haven't come to him. We're not born yet. But the Creator, in His love and in His overwhelming forgiveness for us, died for us before we asked for it. It's amazing in that aspect. We all know Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, right? For by grace we are saved through faith and not of our works that we shouldn't boast. It's unmerited. God's favor for us is not because we're great. It's not because we observe Torah or we come to church and do the ritual correctly or we're good Christians or wear the bracelet, whatever it happens to be. We don't merit God's favor, and we definitely don't merit his forgiveness. So I thought we'd be remiss without you know, touching a little bit on that, but that's all I get to say today about God's forgiveness. Second is the type of forgiveness that we need to ask from other people, Right? It's easy to think about the times, maybe it's not easy. I would say sometimes for me personally, I'll say that. It's easier to think about the times that I was harmed by someone than the times that I harmed other people. And there have been those times too. And we are required as Christians to go and ask for forgiveness and repentance and seek reconciliation with our brothers and sisters that we have sinned against. I, I think one of the greatest passages that shows this is Matthew five twenty one through 26. Um, that we need to seek reconciliation, maybe even before we come to church, before we give an offering, before we go to God in prayer, if we know that we have done wrong by someone else, we're supposed to seek that reconciliation immediately. And through that passage, there are so many examples of us needing to seek forgiveness and reconciliation from our brothers and sisters in Christ. I think one other place that may be overlooked a little bit when we're talking about this topic, but I think is really important, In Paul's uh, church to the letter at Philippi, he says, be of one mind. Don't let there be division among you. Don't let 
you harming each other and then, and then being too proud to, to seek reconciliation, to forgive, allow there to be divisions in the church. Be of one mind. So I think this clearly shows that we are commanded to seek that forgiveness from others when we've transgressed against them, that reconciliation. Because we cannot be the body of Christ and we cannot do the work that we're called to do if there are those rifts between us. John Clayton's a, a personal hero of mine. I think he spoke here, um, yeah, in this church. And uh, John says that, that the, the greatest source of atheism is, is church splits. It's that division. And so I think uh, it's very important to remember that we need forgiveness from each other. But we're going to focus this morning on that third type of scriptural forgiveness, um, the type where we have to forgive others. It's tough. I will give you my thesis this morning, and uh, hopefully it will strengthen you and edify you in your Christian walk. Or if you don't believe me, hopefully I can convince you this morning um, that we forgive others as Christians. There is that difference that I talked about. We forgive others as an outpouring of the forgiveness that we're shown. That's where we get the strength for our forgiveness, is by understanding what's been done for us. God offered that forgiveness, and Jesus came willingly to die on the cross for us while we were in that state of transgression against him. And it's through focusing on that and understanding and being and dwelling in that knowledge that we're able to forgive. Here's my second thesis, if you will. Um, This one may be a harder sell, so, uh, you know, maybe this time, maybe next time. The deeper our faith, the more advanced our walk with Christ, the more we can forgive like him. That our ability to forgive others in a meaningful way, and we'll talk about what that is and that is not, but our ability to forgive others in a meaningful way is an outpouring um, of our understanding of what Christ did for us. So that in the more that, that we walk in Christ, the longer that, that we have followed after him, the more closely we follow after him, the more we mature in our Christian faith, the more we're able to do that. So let's look at that parable just a little bit, Matthew 18, 21 through 35. Um, it can be difficult to understand. Some of the contexts are really foreign to our culture. We don't have debtor's prison in America. And I think some of the, the finer points of what Jesus says, I think very intentionally, um, are lost on us a little bit in our culture. So we'll look at some of those different uh, cultural differences. I think that I found this, uh, this video on the internet and the author said, please feel free to use this in your services. So we're going to watch a quick little five minute video on maybe a modern adaptation of that parable. And then we'll talk about some of those differences. I've got an appointment with Mr. Wood. I have your six o'clock here, Mr. Wood. Mr. Wood will see you now. Thank you. Take a seat, Mr. Martell. Do you know why you're here? Yes, sir. I've been studying your accounts for the last two years, and uh, you have managed to collect an overwhelming amount of debt, $2.3 billion, and not a single effort has been made to make payment. I've contacted the company lawyer. The trial will take place in three weeks, and you have until then to make payment in full. But, sir, how can I ever come up with that much money? Failure to repay the debt will result in a lifetime prison sentence, and the debt will be passed on to your immediate family. My family has nothing to do with this. Your mistakes affect more than just yourself. Please, sir, be patient with me, and I will pay back everything. Tony, you can never repay that debt. 
That's why I've decided to cancel it in full. No, but go and forgive as you've been forgiven. Don't work yourself too hard, Adam. You know me, sir. I never do. <laughs> Tony? You haven't paid rent, Adam. It's been over a month. I left you a note the other day explaining my situation. Don't give me that excuse. Pay back what you owe me every last penny. I get paid next week. Please, be patient with me. I'll pay back everything I owe. That's not good enough. Here's your eviction notice. You must pack your things and leave by tomorrow morning. Did Adam take leave? Well, not exactly. He called to report he'd been evicted. Why didn't he show up for work? I'm not sure. All I know is that he missed his payments and Tony Martell told him to be out of the company apartment by morning. Send Tony in when he gets here. Morning, sir. I canceled all of that debt of yours. $2.3 billion. But you've got the nerve to evict a man from his apartment for not paying his rent for one month? I can explain. I've decided to reinstate all of your debt. Every last penny. How did that feel? This is bonus, it's not on the notes, but in most perils we're supposed to see ourselves as one of the characters. I know that like in the prodigal son, we often want to see ourselves as like the dutiful son that the parable's not about. Or maybe as the forgiving father, which is God and not us. But that's not who we are when Jesus is teaching us I feel really bad. Let me be honest. This might be hypocritical. Well, it is. I feel really bad when I consider the actions of that servant that evicted the other one, right? The unforgiving servant. I thought, what a terrible person. I would not want someone like that in my life. And yet I am that person that has been forgiven so much and yet has failed to forgive. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and look at our scripture together. Um, the, the reading was great. We're just going to, uh, to uh, focus in on a couple things. And then I'd like to discuss some of those differences, do some exegesis, some, some deeper looking into the scripture, and maybe find some of those places where we can find a bit more meaning. So Matthew 18, 21 through 35 reads, I think this is the NASB, uh, if the ESV uh, is up. No, it's not, and that's fine. Um, that's great as well. Okay, 21. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord... How often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Up to seven times. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven, or 77. It's debated, it doesn't matter, right? The answer is this, more times than you can count. You're transgressed against and you forgive. And then it happens again and you forgive. And so many times that you cannot possibly keep count. I think it's interesting here um, that the parable follows this question, and I think that they're directly related. 
See, Peter comes and says seven times, and I don't know this for a fact, but I imagine um, that Peter was trying to be very generous, right? He was trying to, to go big with this number seven. It may seem to us like it's a petty thing, maybe being in Christian culture, I don't know. But the Torah, and especially the tradition at that time, says you forgive three times, right? You forgive once because forgiveness is what God calls us to do. You forgive again because people make mistakes. And man, if someone has really, really just got it out for you, you even forgive them the third time. And after that, let's be honest, it's a habit, right? You have to protect yourself. There, there's, there's no need for you to forgive anymore. That's, this was tradition at that time. But see, Peter had been with Jesus for a while. And again, this is speculation, but I think he imagined, man, if I say three, given what Jesus says to the Pharisees, I am sure that I'm just not going to have gotten it right. So let's double that and maybe add one for good measure. I don't know, but seven is going big, right? And so I imagine that if there was a a verse 22.5, and again, please take this with a large grain of salt. This is my opinion and not necessarily scripture. What probably happened is he said, I'm going to go big. Jesus, do I forgive seven times? Jesus says, no, you forgive more times than you can count. And I imagine that the parable would not have existed if they would have all looked at Jesus and nodded and thought, you know, that is exactly in line with what you've been teaching us. But I imagine that's not the case. I imagine Peter stared at Jesus. I imagine the apostles stared at Jesus. Maybe someone's mouth opened. And Jesus said, okay, let me explain to you why I'm calling you to this very high standard. And I think that Jesus did not underestimate at all that high standard. I I know that Jesus understands the difficulty of being sinned against. He understands the grievous harm that can happen. I believe that Jesus understands that for us, especially as our creator who made us, he understands his creature that there, there is pain in our hearts, that we remember that victim's status and that there's anger. So I think that Jesus doesn't say, well, I don't really understand you, so I'm going to ask you to do something that's very difficult for human beings. No, I think he understands how difficult it is for us to forgive. <clears throat> and so that's why I think Jesus explains. Beginning again in verse 23, For this reason the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, along with his wife and children and all they had until uh, repayment had been made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. How could that slave possibly repay that amount? And the Lord of the slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. Amazing grace. But the slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him 100 denarii, and he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back the amount that was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to the Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. And then verse 35, these are the words of Christ. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. That is a difficult teaching. I think one one more point that, that brings out some of the meaning in the text is the amounts of the money. I'd heard it was a really big amount and kind of a petty nothing amount. I don't think that's the case. So we're going to do a little bit of math. If this is painful for you, please uh, don't listen or repress it later. It's a very small amount. Um, If we assume $7.25 an hour, which is minimum wage right now for us, and let's be clear, they did not have minimum wage like we have minimum wage. They did not have the kind of wealth that we are blessed with in America, but for the sake of argument. Working minimum wage, eight-hour day, is about $58 a day. A day's wage is a denarii, so at 100 denarii, we're looking at $5,800, which is the amount that the second slave 
owed to the unforgiving slave or servant. I don't think that that's a meaningless amount. Um, if you're in a place where that is a meaningless amount to you, um, you live in a different world than I do in a different experience, so I'll have to try to communicate this in a different way. But for the other 99% of us, um, this is not a meaningless amount. And I think that this is important because it directly correlates to Jesus' understanding of the debt. It is not nothing when we transgress each other. It is something. But I think the point is not that Jesus is saying that it's nothing. He's saying that compared to what God does for us, it's relatively small. This is the second half of the math. Fair warning. Um, I think some of the best estimates for a talent of gold, the actual purchasing power of it is about 6,000 denarii. Some say three. But at 10,000 talents, um, the, the amount owed to the master was about $3.48 billion. Does it really matter exactly what the ma- I mean, they said 2.3 on the video. It's close. Um, does it really matter the exact amount? No, it doesn't. But what does matter is, I think, what it is to, to sin against a holy God, to stand in rebellion against our own creator. Do we deserve to live? Does anything deserve to live? Standing in a state of wretched and hateful rebellion against its creator? I think the answer is no. And I think that it's through understanding that there is grievous harm that we do to each other, and this is difficult, and I don't mean to, to lessen or, or to to trivialize our pain of things that have been done to us. But compared to our transgression and what we've been forgiven by God, it is so small that it should encourage us that it bears forgiving all the more thoroughly and all the faster. All right, got ahead of my notes. So we've looked at Peter's question and Jesus' response. I think now we'll take a a little look into the Greek. Um, This won't take very long, but I think it does tell us and show us what early Christian readers would have understood forgiveness to be, what flavor and nuance that they would have understood in the text that maybe that we don't, and maybe we can draw insights as, as Christians into what forgiveness is. In the New Testament, there are two Greek verbs that are translated into the English to forgive. They are aphiemi and chrizomai. Um, a fiemi, which is the more common, is to send something away. That's the literal translation, to send away, a fiemi. It can also mean to let go or to omit, or in, in um, some lesser cases, like the one we're using it for now, to forgive. So the Greek reader would have had a strong sense of sending away vengeance when they considered a fiemi in the context of forgiveness. Now, this passage, every instance of forgiveness is that verb, a fiemi, 46 times in the New Testament, by my count. I think it's also worth noting that charizomai is to show grace. It comes from that base word charis or grace, right? So sometimes in the Bible when it says to forgive, it's talking about a grace kind of forgiving, um, to pardon, to give freely, to forgive. And so that early reader would have had a sense of this is a forgiveness that didn't need to be. It's unmerited. It's totally as an outpouring of the generosity of that person and not a, a, it's a less required kind of forgiveness. Charizomai. So how does this help our understanding? Um, I think it tells us what what the Bible teaches on what forgiveness is. I think it's a very good place to start when we look at understanding what Christian forgiveness is. Forgiveness is a sending away or letting go of a right to personal vengeance, to to settling the score, to getting even eye for an eye. It's our letting go of that. Forgiveness is omitting from our personal records, our book of grudges. It's a pardoning of wrongdoing against us. And forgiveness can be freely showing grace to people that don't deserve that forgiveness. That's what we're recalled to. So, restated, what's the overall takeaway from the parable? I believe that the overall takeaway is God forgives immensely. And in following the example of Christ, so are we required to forgive. Why is it fair for Jesus to require such a high standard? Um... It's because this is the nature of Christ, that even during his excruciating sacrifice, Christ had uh, this immense forgiveness on his heart and even said, forgive them for they know not what they do. See, forgiveness is so ingrained into who Christ is that even when he's scourged and even when he's dying with the sins of the world on his shoulder, which is something that we cannot comprehend, he still has forgiveness not only in his heart, but on his lips. Now I think it's time we'll take a look at what forgiveness is and what forgiveness is not. Um, I have struggled greatly in my personal walk with forgiveness. 
There are some things that are easier and more difficult for each one of us as different parts of the body. And I confess to you that it's not a false humility. Um, I have and can have a tremendous amount of anger and unforgiveness. Um, and it's something that I work on. And, and hopefully, as I conform myself to following after Christ, like we talked about earlier, it's something that, that we get better at in time. So we're going to talk about what forgiveness is and what forgiveness is not. And some of this may be obvious to you, but it wasn't obvious to me. I think, um, quick note, it, it bears talking about before we go on briefly, and then, and then we'll conclude. Um, I think it's, it's not a secret. One of the most difficult things that I've ever had to do and to forgive has happened, you know, when I lived in Boise four or five years ago. It was an incredibly difficult time in my life, and I felt that I was grievously wounded to the point that I was questioning not the existence of God, but I think the rightness of what he teaches and how we're supposed to live as Christians. I was so angry and had such a difficult time forgiving that wounding that I was even willing to question if God really knew what the best way to live was. And that's hard. And I just want to say that... Um, I just want to have an opportunity right now to say thank you to Kevin and to Jan. Um, there were hours when we sat in the car together and talked about forgiveness, and uh, Kevin and I, and uh, Jan sitting with me on the couch drinking tea, where we went through scripture together. And I cannot tell you how thankful I am for the Christian example that they were for me, and um, just for the amazing love and empathy that they were able to model. <clears throat> So, forgiveness. I'd like to talk really briefly about what forgiveness is not. I believe that forgiveness is not a denial of the pain of a wrongdoing. These are some of the reasons that I found it so hard to forgive and some of the things that I hope that I can release you from today. It's not denying the pain of a wrongdoing. We aren't called to lie as a part of forgiveness. And we aren't called to deny that hurt or lie about it as a condition of the forgiveness. Revelation 21 and 4 says, and I read, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. That's what we have, look, that's what we have to look forward to in heaven. It's not what we have here. There will be death. There will be mourning. There will be crying and pain. And we don't have to deny that. All of us, I think, if we're honest, have been hurt by others. All of us. The longer you live, the more you will be hurt by others. And some of us, like I've been saying, have been grievously wounded by the actions of another person. And I'm not trying to downplay that at all. Second, what forgiveness is not, is saying that the sin of a personal transgression is okay. It's not lying about what happened, and it's not saying that sin is okay. Only God forgives sin. We can't forgive it, and we can't say that it's okay, Mark 2, 7. And I think it's important to to distinguish sin, excuse me, um, uh, transgression real quick into three parts. There's, you know, potentially sin, crime, and personal transgression. In the same act, I can sin against holy God by transgressing his law. I can have committed a crime in our culture and in our country, and I can have a personal transgression hurt against another person. So just looking at the sin part, Christ died for sin, Romans 4.25. He who was delivered over because of our sins and was raised because of our justification. It is not our place to diminish that sin. Forgiveness is not saying that sin is okay. And it's not encouraging others to continue sinning. Romans 1.32, and although they know the ordinance of God and those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but they also give a hearty approval to those who practice them. We are not to do that, and it is not a condition of forgiveness. Three, forgiving is not forgetting or naively trusting in the future, and this is difficult. I believe that there's a fine line between them. Some people will say that because God forgets sin, that we should as well, and this isn't true. God forgets nothing. God is omniscient. There is no time when we are going to meet God, and he's going to say, there is a whole lot of things that I think I've forgotten. 
Jeremiah 31, 34, for I will forgive their iniquity and then their sin I will remember no more. He's saying that he won't remember their sin against them. It's not on the ledger. Just as we've looked at, it's confirmed the other meanings of the nuance of forgiveness in Scripture. Same thing. God does not forgive. Forgiveness is, or excuse me, God does not forget in his forgiveness. Forgiveness is not naively trusting. I mean, to forgive is to send away. It's to let go of your personal right to vengeance. It's to say, you hurt me, and everything in me wants to hurt you back, and I think I have that right to hurt you back, and I'm going to let that go. That's what forgiveness is. It is not a requirement to invite great future harm onto yourself. Forgiveness does not require us to act in a naive way. For instance, it it can be anything here. Um, It could be theft. Someone, someone could steal. They could be the treasurer of your club. You could trust them with some sort of money. There can be theft. You can forgive that debt and still require that there's reparations to be made, but you're not going to go after them you know, for, the, for the crime of theft. But that doesn't mean that person's the treasurer in the future. I don't think that's what forgiveness calls us to. Um, if someone, for instance, and I know this is a difficult thing to say, but I feel like I need to say it in the moment. If anyone has been sexually molested or touched, um, this isn't the time. When I was little, I was um, for a brief time, and it, it had incredible damaging consequences for a certain time in my life You know, while I was working on that, um, on forgiving that one, but also to kind of dealing with the ramifications of that pain. And if anyone you know, here has experienced that, my heart goes out to you. I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards. The elders would, Kevin would. Um, Go to Kevin before me. He will do better by you than I will. Um, You can forgive, even in those situations. That person doesn't watch the nursery anymore. You understand what I'm saying? Forgiveness does not require that we naively put ourselves in harm's way. Four of five, forgiveness uh, will not last. It is not just saying, okay, I forgive you, and then leaving that void. Okay? It's not leaving a void of, of revenge where we just continually try to fill that void again by getting angry again about that same thing. See, I think that in order to truly forgive, we have to forgive the way that God forgives, which is we have to fill that with love, that hole that we have, that anger. We have to say, not only do I um, forgive because of what God's given to me, but I forgive you in the same way. Because of my great outpouring for you, I replace that anger. Okay. Okay. So, final few questions. Let me ask you this. What are your thoughts on the response at the end of our reading today? Matthew 18, 32 through 35, the last three verses. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Remember, we are that slave. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over uh, to the tortures until he should be repaid all that was owed him. And 35, Jesus says, my heavenly father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. What do you think about that last verse? I find that sometimes difficult theology is held in tension in scripture, and it's not clear cut either way. I'm not preaching to you a works-based salvation or a works-based lack of unsalvation to you. But if you think that Christ's words are isolated there in Matthew 18, that we need some sort of thick hermeneutic in order to ignore it, let me propose to you the following, Matthew six fourteen through 15, also the words of Christ. For if you forgive, this is after the Lord's Prayer, for if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Those are difficult words. Sometimes I don't know what to do with them, but they are the words of Christ. It's my great hope this morning that uh, this brief study has blessed you in some way. I trust that we, we have a greater appreciation for the strength that's behind Christian forgiveness that's found only through considering the great grace of the cross of Christ. And I hope that our study of what forgiveness is and is not might free you to be able to forgive in a Christian way, in a way that I feel it's freed me. I will close with a a little quote here from C.S. Lewis. I think it's probably on the screen. Yeah. To be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. If you are ready this morning to profess your belief in Jesus Christ and what he has done for us for that great forgiveness that Jesus gave us on the cross, 
to follow after Christ in a life dedicated to service and loving your neighbor and being part of that family. Today is the day to come forward and do that. And if you need the prayers of the congregation of the church, the elders here, um, because of what we talked about this morning or any other reason, please feel free to come forward and make your wishes known as we stand and sing.